All right, ladies and gentlemen, have another great special guest with me today, Mr. Niall O'Leary. Niall, how are you? Great, Richard. Thanks so much for having me on your show. Absolutely. And I, and I like that shirt you got there, the Niall O'Leary School of Irish Dancing. Yep. You know, it helps me remember my name if I forget. <laughs> Very good. So, Niall, tell us your story in Irish dancing, and not just Irish dancing, your story of, of coming here from Ireland to teach. Yeah. Um, some of your younger viewers might never have heard of Kevin Massey, but for some of the older viewers, he's regarded as the best ever Irish dancer. And um, he was in his prime, I would say, in the 50s, 60s, maybe. And um, he started teaching, I guess, in the early 1970s in Dunleary in County Dublin was his main location. Okay. And um, he's well, he's most, for anyone who's heard of him in recent years, he is probably most well known as the guy who trained Michael Flatley to win his world championship. And as many um, people in America will know, Michael Flatley started off with the Dennis Dennehy School of Irish Dance in yes. Chicago. But then uh, Kevin Massey was over, I believe in 1972 and 1974 on the Cultus North American Tours. And uh, he stayed in the Flatley's house. <laughs> Interesting. Came across Michael Flatley. And he saw the young lad dancing around and gave him a few lessons. And then he came back to visit. And then Michael Flatley ended up moving to Ireland because he famously said um, that he figured as an American, he would, never, he would never win the World Irish Dance Championships living in America. And you'd say, looking back now, how wrong he was. But he was, in fact, the first American to win the World Irish Dance Championships. But he did it by living for a year in Ireland, training with Kevin Massey. And he has actually a lovely tribute to Kevin Massey in, in Michael Flatley's autobiography, where he says that Kevin Massey was his choreographer. He was his coach. He was his motivator. He was his kick up the backside. He was his arm around the shoulder. He was basically um, got him to where he was in Irish dancing competitively. And then obviously Michael Flatley went off and did great things after that. But uh, Kevin Massey was my dancing with him in the 1970s. I'm not giving away my age, but um, anyway. <laughs> so um, I was his last All Ireland champion in 1978 because Kevin Massey quit teaching then after that. And then um, I subsequently went on to win the World and All Ireland Championships with the Rory O'Connor School. And um, Rory's daughter, Breda, is still teaching. I don't think the others are, but Breda still is. And anyway, um, so then I ended up uh, doing it. From the age of 15, I was doing a lot of performing with the Rory O'Connor dancers, particularly. We were very fortunate. We were one of the rare um, groups that didn't just perform around St. Patrick's. So we performed year round and we were packed um, with shows in the summer, particularly. We did a number of cabaret shows for American tourists who arrived into Ireland um, oh. on the buses, unbeen, not, not knowing what they were getting into, but we always gave them a great show. And so um, I was doing that for many summers. And as I say, year round, we would do shows as well. And then I had this idea about going to America. And so um, I came over for the summer. To back. I went back actually um, to do a show in Blackpool in England that I'd already committed to in the October of the same year. And I went back to do um, a big show in the Point Theatre where Riverdance had started right. for the Christmas, but a pantomime actually, where I was acting and dancing in it. But apart from that, I, um, I've been in America pretty much ever since. Oh, okay. Well, that's good. That's good. Now, talk about, um, uh, talk briefly about your teacher, about Kevin Massey, because I've heard those statements as well that, you know, yeah. flatly uh, attributing a lot to him. So as someone who, who yourself took from that dance master, uh, what do you think was, was unique about his style that helped flatly go from obviously a very accomplished dancer to a world champion? Well, I'd have to say that, yeah, well, I learned particularly by watching there were two uh, particular things, watching Kevin Massey and copying what he did. I guess I was good at copying him um, <laughs> because other people have said to me that my dancing reminded me of his dancing, which is obviously if, if your dancing reminds you, reminds someone of your teacher, that's probably the greatest compliment. It is. But he had great cuts. He was really sharp with his cuts. And I've, I've actually was hanging out, not to be name dropping now, but I was hanging out with Michael Flatley a few years ago. And he said to me, he says, Kevin Massey's cuts, he says, were so fast that you couldn't see his legs. Wow. Brilliant. And it's true. And I remember just watching him. And the other thing was that he actually threatened me to be favorite sayings when he was teaching me were, I'll crucify you was the first one. And the second one was, I'll take your life. Oh, God. Imagine a dancing teacher saying that to a child today. The parent no. would be in the child protection services being jail time would be the result. Exactly. And Kevin Massey was saying things like that to me when I was young. And that's how I got good. <laughs> but I would never say that to a child now. I have to say that straight mm -hmm. out. I would never consider saying that. I think it's yeah. awful. But yeah. I got good. Yeah, times have changed for sure. Yes, they have. Yeah. He yeah. wasn't the only one saying things like that. I think we can be fairly sure of that. No, no, absolutely. Yeah, I'm old enough to remember uh, 
things along the same lines, not for my dance teacher, but just, you know, in general. So yeah, it, uh, yeah. times have changed. Um, so talk about, you know, how you got, uh, obviously you came to America and you wanted to teach Irish dancing. Talk about those early days where you're trying to set up your school in an area that you're not all that familiar with. Well, I came over and um, working full time and working flat out as an architect. And I still have my own architectural practice um, in New York City mostly. We do stuff around the tri-state area. But, and we're focusing on good design, you know? But that's what I was doing full time. And I was teaching dancing kind of evenings and weekends and doing some shows here and there, you know? Right. And, so, and then um, I started my own architectural practice after a number of years. And that's when I suppose I had more time to be doing the dancing. And so we started off, obviously, we, we started off actually, we did an adult beginner class, we did a children's beginner class, and we had one, uh, my first ever student actually in America was Dara Carr, who's now right. um, combining Irish dancing and modern dance. And she had, we had had dinner one night. She moved to New York around the same time as me. And I was like, how about you go and compete in the world's one more year? And she was like, yeah, I'd love to do it. And so she was my first ever student. So it was kind of cool. But apart from that, we had a group of promising beginners. And my first adult class, there was a guy who was from New Jersey who insisted on speaking Irish all the way through class. And I was like, dude, nobody understands what you're saying. Can you please just speak English? People are going to get upset. Yeah. <laughs> and then there was another guy in the class who... Um, he suddenly started dancing the jig. Dude, you stole my style. <laughs> and like I was saying about Kevin Massey, this guy was starting to dance like me, and I was a bit, I was a bit freaked out. I was like, dude, like, <laughs> I didn't want you to get that good. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So, how many stu- uh, locations and students? You don't have to get specific, but like a range of, you know, how big is your school now? Yeah, well, we started off and um, we were in Manhattan and Queens and then we spread out to the other boroughs and we've had classes in Staten Island in New York for years. And we've, cl- we've now locations actually in um, New York, in Florida, in Miami, in Mexico. And we also have a new location in the Midwest, in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Oh, wow. That's, that's amazing. That's really good. So how many teachers do you have working for you? I've had quite a few actually. And uh, we've a number of people who are TCRGs and uh, Rosemary Cooper would be my main assistant teacher. And then she got her TCRG maybe three or year, two years ago, I think, at this point, yeah. Okay. And okay. then we have a number of other assistant teachers who jump in and help out with the classes as well, you know. You know, and, it takes a village, um, as they say, yeah. It does, absolutely, yeah. And so we have a number of promising dancers. We've been doing dance dramas for years, and we were planning on bringing, uh, which were um, take, to, due to take place in the first week in April in Dublin, uh, the 50th um, on Commission and World Championships. And unfortunately, obviously, uh, like everything else, it got cancelled. But um, there's always next year. And so um, we've been doing dance drama for years, but we've also had a number of uh, solo dancers over the years who've placed highly in the world championships. And um, we've a number of dancers in our classes in Mexico who are actually getting really good. And it's very exciting. Uh, We've Daniela Sanchez and her mother, Marcella, are teaching our classes in uh, It's really exciting that some dancers now are really, really making great progress. You know, it is it is interesting to see Irish dance become this global uh, phenomenon as far as, you know, the shows contributed greatly to that. But then after the show sort of paved the way, teachers like yourself and others have gone in and, and filled in that gap where people didn't have access to Irish dance and they were learning off videos and just wherever they can learn it. That's pretty interesting. Uh, Absolutely, yeah. Both. yeah. Yeah, I'm very lucky that um, I've been performing now for over 15 years with um, Mick Maloney's Greenfields of America. And with Mick Maloney now, I've got to travel to places in the world where, like Vietnam and Thailand and Burma, and we've been to Cuba a number of times. And I remember um, a guy stopped me on the street. I was wearing some sort of shirt with Ireland or something on it. And I was in Havana, Cuba. And a guy stopped me on the street and he's like, you're from Ireland? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, river dance. Yeah. And like, it's amazing how that, um, that show and all the shows after it, but I suppose you'd say the ones after it, um, came because of Riverdance as well. But that show in particular has expanded, you would say, the reach of Irish dancing in a way that no other show or no other event ever had before or ever will again, I would say. And like, you know, you'd say the dancing class was, the first one was um, when, the dan- when the dancing teachers started traveling around Ireland. When they started, when they started the traveling dancing master thing sure. in the late 17th, early 18th century, I think it was, that's when that started, then there was an explosion of interest in Irish dancing. And then there was river dance, and um, then there was the current situation. And we don't know how that's going to end up. How is it affecting you? How are you? How have those limitations affected you guys? Well, we're having to do all the classes virtually, like everyone else, you know. And so it's a challenge, obviously, um, to try and connect with people virtually. More, I, I suppose, dancers are not as high up the ladder in terms of Irish dancing. They're not um, really able to engage as well successfully with the with the 
classes online, you know, but I think that um, people who are motivated, people who are driven, they just keep doing it, you know, that's the thing. But it's hard sometimes when you've had like certain goals taken away from you and particularly the lack of opportunities for dancers in the New York area particularly to compete because I find of all places I've been, the New York um, tri-state, the tri-state area has so many fesh in it that some people like they just go from week to week going to a fesh or maybe two fesh in it every weekend. And if you're only used to going to a fesh, uh, you know, every second month or something, you mightn't, you might notice a big difference in your life. But when you're going to a fetch every weekend, it's such a huge change. And to be sitting at home every weekend, it's just strange. You know? It is. And, and people have definitely had to band together and, you know, support each other and yeah. <laughs> teachers supporting each other and dancers, all that kind of stuff. And I know there's been several uh, Facebook groups that's been formed to sort of collaborate amongst teachers and uh, various stripes to it's like, you know, what are you doing? What are you doing? How are you, you know, helping each other out? Do you see, where yes. do you see that collaboration going after we sort of uh, resume quote unquote normal activities and we're all kind of doing our own live classes again? Do you see a continuation of that collaboration or do you think it's going to just unfortunately go by the wayside when it's not needed anymore? I think um, it's definitely going to continue. And there's two things that are, are, I think, remarkable about it. And one is the fact that there's dancing teachers all over the world who are connecting with each other. And a lot of dance and teachers would have been focused on their own class or they might have known the, the teachers in their region. But, um, and I was lucky enough, I suppose, because I've been teaching in different places around the world, I already knew quite a lot of people, but I didn't know everyone. And the other great thing about it is that there's teachers who are from loads of different organizations or maybe no organization who are now all connecting and helping each other out. And I think before some people were a little bit parochial and there's a history obviously of Irish dancing teachers just focusing on their own group and right. maybe it's a little competitiveness that comes out in the teachers when they still want to compete and they end up, um, you know, being a bit competitive. But um, people are now working together with all different groups um, from every kind of Irish dancing organisation. And I think there is definitely more going to come out of it. And I hope there will be some collaborations competitively as well resulting out of this group. Yeah, it, it would be good to see this, this, um this coming together continue on it, it can't be a bad thing you know we're all really trying to do the same thing you know and pr let's promote this amazing dance culture that we all belong to so yeah yeah no it's it's wonderful that people are not just talking to each other but actually helping each other out and um there's people that i thought i knew and now i've got to know them actually better and i must say uh, the irish dancing teachers as a group are a great group of people and i think when you're busy teaching your own classes you don't get a chance to get to know other people. And it's great now that there's some people who have really come out to themselves and um, we're all helping each other out. And that's the way it should have been all along, really. I, I agree. And that's, I'll tell you, that is the genesis of the idea of creating this podcast was to yeah. tell, there's so many stories. You've got a unique story. I've got a story. Everyone's got a story. And while there's some differences, there's a lot of similarities. And I think we can all learn something from each other. And uh, it's interesting to find out what motivates each person to commit their self to teaching like this. Now, I understand you also judge too, is that right? Yes, um, I've been adjudicating for quite a number of years and I've luckily enough, I've got, I've got to judge some of the major championships in the last few years. I judged the World Irish Dancing Championships in Glasgow in 2018. And then I judged the Great Britain Championships last October, which were in the lovely seaside town of Torquay in the south of England. And so, you know, it's, it's wonderful seeing great dancing sitting in the audience but to be sitting there for like nine days in a row at the world's was very intense and um it was actually just a lovely experience uh, to to have to challenge yourself to find the best winners and generally speaking um i was happy with my results i think that you know you do what you feel is right in the moment and i was looking for the best performance on the day and i think i found it in most cases right yeah so i was gonna i was gonna ask you about that uh that experience going from T student at one time, the teacher to judge, and then, and not just judge, but a, ju a judge that walks into the world, their world championships for the first time as a judge, not as a competitor, just as a teacher. And you sit down amongst the panel and you think, I'm going to see the world's best Irish dancers. What goes through your mind after that? When the first ones walk out on the stage? Well, um, yeah, if they look nice, that's like, oh, that's, but like, that's nice that you look nice, but <laughs> let's see what you can do. And the thing is that, um, you know, I approach the, every situation with an open mind, but um, I'm really kind of, I suppose, looking for a needle in a haystack in a way. 
in that at the level of skill and talent that is now on display at the World Championships, the average person might not um, be able to pick the top 10. In a lot of competitions, the average person will know the winner and um, because the winner sometimes stands out above everyone else. But, but sometimes there's three or four people who could be the winner, you know? And so it's very difficult, I think, to adjudicate um, a huge competition, firstly, but it's also very difficult to adjudicate in a way that, you know, the, the average person watching is going to agree with you because, like, as I say, it's very difficult to see little, little details in the footwork very often and maybe little mistakes sometimes will make the difference between first place and second place. And the average person mightn't see that. And so if I was to let myself think, oh, um, am I picking the popular winner here? But I can't let myself to think that because I'm there to find the best dancer on the day. And naturally, when you're dealing with human beings, um, nobody's going to perform their best every day. And particularly children like, are not going to be able to turn it on at a moment's notice every single day. And like, you hope that somebody will be able to um, you know, have their training program peak at the right moment. But clearly, people have good days and bad days. And you never know how someone's going to dance. And sometimes somebody who you know is really brilliant doesn't do a good performance. And it's like, wasn't your day today, you know? So Yeah. yeah. Uh, talk, Niall, about the, uh, the progression in Irish dancing footwork and movements that you've experienced over your time of dancing. Well, I would say that the kind of dancing now um, that you would win first place with in novice today would probably have won you like a major championship like 40 years ago. There's no doubt about that. And like, I suppose you can compare it to athletics where now there's many men have ran under 10 seconds for the 100 meters. But in Irish dancing, um, the music has stayed pretty much the same. The length of the dances has stayed the same. Dexterity and technical accomplish accomplishment, the amount of dexterity and technical accomplishment has gone through the roof. And it's amazing now uh, to see the skill level and the athletic level and the level of artistry uh, on display in Irish dancing. And people who said, oh yeah, I've seen Riverdance, Irish dancing is amazing. They actually don't realize that was 25 years ago. Yeah. Irish dancing has come on so much since then in terms of the skill level and the amount of training people are putting into it. Definitely, I remember talking uh, to Donny Golden in New York actually um, one day and he was saying, we used to just show up. There was no one, no one like, took it too seriously <laughs> and that's the thing like that um, and I was thinking yeah I guess I did that as well but I didn't think of it like that but that's actually years ago like you just you, you went to class and you practiced a little bit at home but then you just showed up and you mightn't even stretch like you just did it and um, it's completely different now and people have this argument about is Irish dancing an art or is it a sport right. and the answer is clearly is both yeah. and like if you're training for something to that level of intensity that's just not an art form. An art form is something that you would do, that you're proud of your culture and you just do it. But this is, in addition to that, it's also a sport where people are training um, with a specific goal in mind. And when there's so many major championships, now years ago, you'd think like, oh, if it's the Great Britain Championships, surely there's going to be people from Great Britain winning all the championships. But, but when I was judging it um, last October, as in the last number of years, there's dancers from all over the world in it. And so um, people travel for the major championships. And so when you're training all year round, pretty much, like you, I guess there's a short break after the North American championships, typically you take the summer off. Right. But like people are training really intensely. And so I do really feel strongly that Irish dancing is not getting the recognition it deserves, both in terms of media and in terms of like governmental support, particularly from the Irish government. And it's unfortunate that the Irish government have adopted a model um, for the arts that they don't. But if they were to realise that Irish dancing is a sport, um, that would be totally different. Mm -hmm. Now I'll talk about what uh, the way you feel about seeing. Obviously, the you know the Irish dance culture is is near and dear to you, being an Irishman yourself. Talk about what it must feel like to see so many different um, nationalities and countries adopt. Uh, you know, Irish dancing and, and being able to see those different cultures uh, enjoy it as much as, as you might as an Irishman. Oh, it's actually wonderful. Yeah. And it's amazing um, to see places like where there's no obvious like Irish person around, like in most of the dancing schools in Mexico don't have an Irish person 
like actually I think I'm like there are some other Irish people teaching in Mexico but but not living in Mexico and teaching the children every week and the same thing now I find in places like Japan and like even South African places like there's places where they've done it themselves and they have sought out the best training either going to Ireland bringing dancers to Ireland or bringing people occasionally from Ireland or elsewhere but like there's so much great dancing around the world and it's one thing to see people try something and not be that good at it but we're not talking about that we're talking about people who have no obvious reason for doing Irish dancing right and yet they're brilliant at it and there was a video um went viral recently of Morgan Bullock from the southern region USA and um it got a lot of people's attention because a lot of people were like we didn't know that people would be doing Irish dancing who are not Irish and it's like yeah. what like <laughs> what are you, you know yeah well to us yeah it's crazy but to the people outside the Irish dance world they think well you have to be Irish to do this and we just we just laugh you know it's like no yeah. <laughs> it's amazing like yeah it's yeah. like some people are very innocent really you know <laughs> right, right they don't know what they don't know um yeah. Now, you also play music. You also are a very accomplished uh, button accordionist. Is that right? Uh, piano accordion, actually. I play okay. the piano accordion, and I play the spoons, and I play the little barn, and I play the keyboards as well. So okay. I'm, I'm here like, like I have a keyboard here, but I actually don't. I'm just pretending. But um, whenever I say fiddle, I have to do this as well. But I don't play the fiddle. But, um, yeah, I've been lucky enough that I've got hired to play accordion and piano um, all over North America, particularly for Irish dancing competitions. And it's great, very rewarding now playing the music for the dancing as well, you know. And um, I also play um, events and sessions and we do corporate entertainment in New York City and further afield, a lot of weddings and things like that. And I run a regular event in Paddy Riley's Music Bar. Uh, it's every Thursday night um, in normal times, you say, 10.30 p.m. Irish Culture Night in Paddy Riley's Music Bar in New York City. And we would be celebrating the 10th anniversary of doing this Irish Culture Night uh, this month, but um, we may not be celebrating it in the actual venue, unfortunately. And the thing about it is that it's the only session where there's always dancing and I'm there dancing myself. Or if I'm not there, if there's some week I'm out of town, there's some other dancer or dancers come in and dance. And we do a music session and a dance jam. And I've, set, I've had people say to me, oh, I'll be in now to dance the Siege of Venice. Well, we <laughs> might do that, but we don't do that every week. We do a dance jam where we have this wooden box and some of my own dancers and dancers from other schools and dancers from out of town hear about it and they come in, bring in their shoes and they, or even without their shoes and they get up and they dance and it's actually great crack. And you know, we tailor the music to the dancers as well because we kind of know what kind of music dancers like that right. um, we play fast, lively music and we'll do a set dance for people. Watching this. Or if we see somebody, like we had a situation a few months ago where we had a former world champion just hanging out at the bar. <laughs> just hanging out. <laughs> I played his set dance and of course he got up and danced it. Oh, that's awesome. That's amazing. Talk about the culture between uh, the, the culture that you've developed and people like you've helped develop in New York, as opposed to the Irish culture that you may experience if you go to Ireland. So there's obviously a lot of pubs and stuff in both places, and there's the music and never dan in the dancing. But what about the differences? Well, I would say now um, New York actually is very similar to Ireland in that there's a lot of people passing through, and people passing through from Ireland and people traveling um, around the United States. And so we're lucky that there's always somebody new in town. And I think New York City particularly, and maybe Boston, because they're the two closest cities geographically and in terms of flights to Ireland uh, in the United States, that there's a lot of people back and forth. And there's a lot of um, the, the musical talent pool from Ireland passes through New York and Boston quite a bit. And so we're very fortunate that we've a, a more of a direct connection than let's say other cities have. In the United States. But I think the idea of musicians sitting in a semicircle or a circle or whatever and playing music, um, it's a great concept and it works really the world over. And it's not about, I suppose, people one upping each other. It's really just about everyone playing together. And usually the session leader will, you know, ask somebody to join in or to start a tune maybe. And um, it's usually run in a very democratic way. And I think the beauty of a session is that it's not about, um, anything except the music and there's people I know in the Irish music scene who might have all kinds of crazy ideas about other things in the world but when we're all playing music together we're all in it together. You're all unified yeah that's great. Yeah. Um, so we've talked a lot about collaborations uh, musically and dance wise now you've got something that you've got going on you and I guess some other dance teachers have going on speak about that. Uh, yes there's a big event on this coming Sunday and it's a virtual Irish Dance Festival. It's the 19th annual New York City Irish Dance Festival presented by the Irish Arts Centre 
NYC. And the Irish Arts Centre has been around since the early 1970s. And um, they're just building a new building, which should be ready by the end of this year. But um, this festival was always taking place on a pier on the west side of Manhattan. And we've had some glorious um, weather over the years, this, is, this being the 19th one. But um, unfortunately this year, there's no pier and it's all pretty much indoors. But it, the great thing about it is it's a virtual festival and so everyone can participate. We're having some dance school performances, my own dancing school are performing, and there's some other groups as well. Donnie Golden, I mentioned earlier, Dara Carr is involved in it. And then we're having some um, musical entertainment where people can get up and jam. And the whole point is that we want people to jam at home. And we've Joni Madden, famous uh, whistle yeah. and flute player, leader of the band Chersa Ladies. And then we've got a young, uh, brilliant fiddle and bower on and dancer, Jake James. He's going to be playing the fiddle and he's going to be accompanied by Porrick Allen, who is the leader of the McLean Avenue Band. Who play, They actually played the music at the World Irish Dancing Championships all week. Mm. Um, North Carolina last year and Jake plays with the band quite a bit as well and so um, it's going to be great music and then we're doing some workshops as well we've got some workshops in Shandos Dancing and Modern and I'm doing some Celtic tap improv myself so <laughs> the plan is to get people to uncross their feet oh. and get down off their toes and have a little fun you know there you, you speak of that I want to touch on that for a minute there is definitely a movement uh, for people to, to be very improvisational with Irish dancing uh, where do you think that comes from? Do you think it's sort of a return back around from to sort of back to tap and clogging and Shino's dancing, or is it just something completely new? Well, I think, yeah, it's, it's definitely um, as a result of cross-pollination, I would say, that um, the Shannos dancers have been the only ones really that have been improvising with two Irish music for many years, you know? And whenever you'd see somebody doing any other kind of dancing, like there was a, there was a video which was really good, actually, of the Fitzgerald family, I think it was at the Dublin, Ohio Festival a few years ago, and they were jamming away, doing their, uh, I guess it's um, some kind of traditional Canadian dancing, is it Nova Scotia dancing or Cape Breton, yeah. or something yeah. like that they were doing, Newfoundland dancing I think it is actually, oh. and they were doing that, and a video went up on the internet, and so many people were like, that's not Irish dancing, and it's like, what are you like, that's amazing dancing, it's just not what you're used to, you know? And the thing is that um, sometimes people need their minds expanded, you know? And so, like, it's amazing how in the competitive Irish dancing world, in every possible situation, there's really no um, opportunity for improvisation. And there's no reward for improvisation. It was never a thing, really. The idea was that you do a pre-choreographed dance. And so, like... That was, that's what it's like being like for years. And so now I think people are experimenting and like, I suppose you'd say the first person um, in competition who improvised was the person who forgot their step. <laughs> and uh, it's gone beyond that now where people are actually listening to the music and the Shando dancers, I suppose, were the first ones you'd say to dance to Irish music and listen to it and kind of react to it. And um, clearly there's people now putting on tap shoes. Some brilliant Irish dancers have started putting on tap shoes. Yeah. And I'm um, not sure how I feel about that. But anyway, um, they're doing amazing percussive footwork. And in many cases, they're doing amazing improvisation to Irish music. So it can be done. And the thing is, like, how do you do it? And, well, I'm, I'm going to be talking and dancing, explaining and teaching a little bit about that on Sunday. And yeah. so the festival begins at 4 p.m. No, it begins at 2 p.m. The festival begins at 2 p.m., East Coast time, 2 p.m. New York time, and there's workshops first, and then there's performances, and it goes on till 4, 4.30 p.m. I think it's 2 p.m. to 4.30 p.m., and it's going to be live on Facebook, Facebook Live, and also on YouTube. Okay, we'll definitely have to, I'll have to get you to send me a link to that. I definitely want to promote Absolutely. That. Yeah, now I'm going to throw you a little curveball here, because you talk about the, the dancers uh, donning tap shoes, which I don't know yeah. if Michael Flatley created that, but it's a, certainly the first question I ever saw. I have like a hybrid dance shoe. Now, my my uh, first Irish dance teacher came from Dublin, and he was telling us that... Who's that? Who's that? Uh, uh, it's the Omelady clan. I had several of the Omeladies. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> yeah. And um, he was telling me that they had shoes that had hobnails in the top of them. And I've seen pictures of them. They're like a, they're those little nails, you know, they, they nailed in the top of the shoe and it looked like a tap. So I've always been curious if that was the, the uh, predecessor to the fiberglass shoes, how come a tap never was uh, adapted and they went from that to fiberglass? It seems like they would go from something to look like a tap to a tap. 
Yeah, well, you know, um, it's a guy now who just closed his store after many years, John McSweeney, who told me that the first, he, he ran the Talbot Dance Centre in Dublin for many years. It was Connolly's shoe shop before that. And he told me that the first ever uh, shoes that people changed into, specifically to do Irish dancing, were nuns' shoes because they were tightly fitting around your foot, right? And then it was another dancing teacher in Dublin who told me that, and I think in the early 70s, they started doing the double sole and the topies, and then the nails came in. And so the thing with the nails was that, like, yeah, they were all little individual little nails, but once you started dancing in them, like, the nails would all meld, melt together. And right. you almost had, like, what looked like a tap shoe, because all mm. these little nails would end up melting together. And the reason that they went out of fashion, particularly, was because if you had one loose nail, it would rip a tear in a floor. Oh. And so um, you wouldn't be let into any dance studio nowadays with shoes <laughs> with nails on them. And um, there's a number of studios that I've rented space in where they're like, don't rent to the following. And like, I've had to show them the shoes because yeah. um, it wouldn't be too short. But the thing is that um, for some reason then, fiberglass became a thing because I think the fact is that you know, somebody obviously discovered that fiberglass was a good material for getting a sound. And I think it was a bit like um, maybe the GAA in Ireland, where they had a, the Gaelic games in Ireland, they had a rule that if you played hurling or Gaelic football, that you couldn't play soccer. Hmm. So they didn't want anyone playing the foreign games. And I think in Irish dancing, they didn't want anyone wearing the foreign shoes. Right, right. And they didn't want to doing any other dancing. Like, And I enjoy telling people in America particularly that when I was growing up, I wasn't learning Irish dancing. It wasn't called that. It was called dancing. Oh, okay. It was just native to you. Yeah. yeah. And so the, the idea of like, you know, um, nowadays you can, you can get some amazing like West African and hip hop and tap dancing classes in Ireland. There's amazing teachers. But years ago, like there was a bit of ballet, but ballet was considered a little bit highbrow for some people. Mm. And um, if you wanted to dance, you did Irish dance. That was really the, the only thing available for a lot of people. And, um, but obviously not anymore. But the thing is that I think the Irish dancing is definitely coming from historically the attitude that like you should only be doing Irish dancing. And in fairness, like, you know, in the late 19th century, early 20th century, when the Conor na Gaelga, the Gaelic League was founded, uh, they had to kind of, I suppose, downplay other activities to promote Irishness because they were afraid that Irishness was going to get lost um, because at the time we were still a uh, part of the United Kingdom. Right. And so um, there was a huge concern that if we didn't promote our own culture above all other cultures, that um, people would either disown it or just lose interest in it. So there was a sense to it at the time, but um, it doesn't make much sense now to ban tap shoes. But to this day, you're not allowed to wear tap shoes in an Irish dancing competition. Right, competition, yeah. They definitely do sound good on a stage, though. Uh, they do, you know, they do indeed, yeah. Very clean. But if, if you have a screw loose now, it's another story. <laughs> <laughs> so Niall where do you see uh, Irish dancing as we know it not just the the uh, the dance form itself but the way it's put together packaged organized where do you see that going in 10 years the next 10 years I see it um, on primetime TV and I Probably. see big money prizes <laughs> and I think there's going to be a professional circuit of Irish dancers in the near future that would be incredible I'm all for that you know more the more opportunities, the better it is for all of us. Yeah. But I think there's going to have to be um, some megalomaniac multimillionaire is going to have to step forward and say, I want to promote this. This is amazing. Well, we know the biggest Irish dance promoter of all times. <laughs> He's still very capable. <laughs> yes, he is indeed. Um, maybe we need to have somebody whisper in his ear. Twist his arm a little bit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That would be good. I think Irish dancing it may take a little bit of time, but I think it could support itself on a, in a national platform, uh, international platform like yeah, that. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a shame when you think of the amount of effort that, let's say, somebody training for the Olympics puts in and the amount of training that somebody puts into Irish dancing competitions. And you compare then the recognition that each one gets. Like the Irish dancers are now famous because of the internet. They're famous amongst the Irish dancing scene. Uh, which wasn't the case, obviously, years ago. There was no way of promoting it. But um, they should be more famous than that, I believe. Like, with the amount of talent, the amount of skill involved, I think that Irish dancing deserves a much broader audience than it currently has. 
So when are we going to see a, a collaboration between the the older Irish dance masters out there? You know, all the young the young ones are out there tearing it up, and it's amazing to watch. But you know, there's there's some of those older folks out there that can still uh, kick a jig too. You're going to have to ask the older ones that question. <laughs> I would love to see that. I would love to see that. Uh, that would be incredible. So, Niall, where can people find out more information about your school and about, uh, uh, you know, the different projects that you may be working on? Yeah, well, at the moment, actually, um, we're doing, we're, we're promoting, actually, at the moment, uh, we're doing now video classes so that, like, there was a time, obviously, that um, people only took Irish dancing class locally. Right. And um, I've been teaching classes, obviously, around the world in different places. But even in New York City, there were people who said to me, can you do like an early morning class on a Tuesday or can you do a class on Sunday night? And it's like, I want to do it, but I don't have, it doesn't fit in my schedule. And so for that reason now, we're doing um, worldwide video classes. We have some new students in random places in the world who've decided that um, this is for them. And we're not particularly looking um, to train people who've already done lots of Irish dancing. We're looking for people who never had the opportunity to try it because it either wasn't in their area or it didn't suit their schedule. So we're doing video classes and our slogan is um, contactless dancing in a contactless world and also uh, stay at home and dance away. There we go. So you can find information at uh, www.nileoleary.com and um, that's my general website where there's a link to my architecture, to the my Irish dance school, um, my Irish dance troupe, my professional dance troupe, who are also performing um, on Sunday. And there's also a link to the festival that I mentioned earlier, um, the New York City Irish Dance Festival. Okay. Niall, I appreciate you coming on the podcast and taking your time to share with us uh, your, your dance and music background, your judging uh, experiences, and the new collaboration that you guys have, have uh, started to come together with. Thanks so much, Richard. It was great talking to you and some great questions and I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. And hi right. to all, your, all the viewers and hope to see everyone in person soon. Absolutely. And we wish you and the school uh, all the best of luck in the future. Thanks so much.